Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Content Patch for the 17th of December 2012. My name is Total Biscuit with around 15 to 20 minutes of gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show today, Valve acquires Starfield Studios, Turbine resurrects Asheron's Call 2, Dark Souls 2 may not be ready for 2013, Kickstarter is more popular than ever, and Rayman Jungle Run named Game of the Year on the App Store. A small development house that you most likely have not heard of because it consists of two people and was only started up very recently by the name of Starfield Studios has been acquired by Valve and plan to open a new office in San Francisco. This of course makes perfect sense considering Valve is also doing exactly the same thing as announced just a few short days ago. The founder of the company, which consists of two guys by the name of Todd Semple, has been involved in many games including as a developer for Plants vs Zombies and a senior software engineer at LucasArts and Blizzard North. So he was involved with Diablo 3 as well as Star Wars The Force Unleashed. It appears that the acquisition was spurred on by a visit to Valve by Todd Semple on September 20th this year, and on October 11th it was mentioned that he was having lunch with an unnamed billionaire, which is assumed to be Gabe Newell. It may surprise people to know that Gabe Newell is actually a billionaire. He is. As of March this year, he became the newest in the billionaire list, which ranks 1,226 global billionaires. His estimated net worth as of March this year is $1.5 billion, and by the sounds of it, it very well might end up being a hell of a lot more if Steam continues to pick up the pace. So, you know, PC gaming is dead and all that. But also bear in mind that Gabe Newell had quite a bit of money before he even started Valve in the first place. He was actually responsible for the port of Doom over to Windows 95 and all sorts of other crazy stuff over there as well as being involved in the first three iterations of Windows in a pretty damn key way. So yeah, this guy has quite the history. As regards to the acquisition, this in my opinion can only be good news and obviously the studio hasn't actually done anything yet. So as far as I'm concerned, it looks like we may very well have more in-house development on certain Valve projects. I'm hoping that means cool games, but who knows, really. There's no real way to know exactly why this company was acquired and what they intend to create, especially bearing in mind that there are only two of them. It is entirely possible that they may have been acquired on simply a consultancy basis. It might be an in-house consultancy team that has been created, or it very well might be another smaller studio designed to develop games under the Valve brand. One way or the other, more Valve games cannot be a bad thing. In a rather surprise move, Turbine, the developers of Asheron's Call, as well as Lord of the Rings Online and Dungeons & Dragons Online, have re-released Asheron's Call 2 completely free for previous subscribers of the game. They've opened up a new server and the game is available to play for anyone that was a previous subscriber to Asheron's Call, whether it be 1 or 2. A Turbine producer over on the Asheron's Call forums described it as a beta, which would be indicative of a possible free-to-play relaunch at some point, but currently it is entirely free and available to those who previously subscribed to Asheron's Call. Unfortunately, that also means that it is only available to those who previously subscribed to Asheron's Call. So if you wish to try it out right now and you've never played the game, then you will unfortunately be out of luck. But it is nice to see re-releases and revivals of older MMOs, and who knows how successful it could potentially be at this point. That said, it's looking a little bit dated, though it certainly has some very interesting features that might very well be worth having a look at. I'm intrigued by the notion, honestly, especially when it comes down to MMOs. A lot of MMOs seem to be released at the wrong time, and what happens is they die, they die horribly. And it's almost like, well, if they were to revive it at a later date when trends had changed, when gamers wanted different things, then maybe, just maybe, things would have gone better for them. It is very much a possibility that a game like Asheron's Call 2 would be a little bit more popular these days than it was back in 2005. Bear in mind, of course, WoW came out in 2004, Asheron's Call 2 was taken offline in 2005 due to lack of players. I have to wonder, now that we have more experienced MMO players, that 
maybe something like Ashwan's Call 2 would end up being a little bit more popular, but I don't imagine seeing people flocking to it, especially when it's a pretty old-looking game. It's a nice piece of nostalgia at the moment, and it's good to see MMO heritage preserved and, of course, made available to those who own the game. It's always a bit of a pain in the ass when you buy something in a box and then can't play it a couple of years down the line because all of the servers have gone offline. When it comes to MMOs, there are a lot of boxes that people own that are quite literally useless because the game is offline for good. At least with a single player game, you can play that whenever you want. With an MMO, you buy the box and then the servers go down and you are utterly boned. So it's cool to see it coming back and perhaps we may see it be released in general for everybody. It could very well just be a completely free promotional game that they release in order to drive traffic and interest to their other games, DDO and Lord of the Rings Online, which are both doing pretty well at the moment. Or alternatively, they could be looking for a transition through to free-to-play, although I have to wonder how easy it would be to adapt an old game like Asheron's Call to something like a free-to-play model. We will see going forward, but if you were an Asheron's Call player, then I would suggest you head on over and dip your toes in once again, because it is available for you and you don't have to pay a damn thing. In a feature with Edge magazine, the developers of Dark Souls 2 indicated that the game may very well not be ready for 2013. Currently the game is around 25% complete and development began in September 2011. It stated that Dark Souls 2 has a much larger development team than the original Dark Souls and the so-called world creation staff responsible for level design and, of course, creating the world, all aspects of doing so, has in fact almost doubled. But it is possible that we will not see a 2013 release. The game is still planned to be released on current generation consoles rather than next gen, and according to the article in question, the graphics are comparable to Ubisoft's Watch Dogs and Star Wars 1313, which are both considered to be games that will be pushing the current generation hardware to its absolute limit. Among some of the features of the new title that have been revealed is the fact that the Covenant system will be made clearer and more accessible and will also include a morality system and also the story will most likely be a little more obvious as opposed to obfuscated and hidden. It's slightly disappointing to hear that honestly because unfortunately it seems like Dark Souls and indeed Demon Souls are one of the few titles that come out whereby the story isn't shoved into your face from the very very start and you have to discover it and interpret it in your own way and I found the lore of Dark Souls to be very interesting although I can certainly see why it wouldn't be so appealing to some people. I'm hoping they don't go all out with a ton of cutscenes, a bunch of exposition that serves no purpose really other than to lead people by the nose. The whole point of Dark Souls is to allow you to explore the world and figure it out yourself, whether it be in terms of fighting the monsters which are horribly murdering you, or whether it be a case of trying to interpret the timeline and figuring out why things are the way that they are. It's an interesting change and one that may not entirely be for the better, but I am happy that the game has been delayed, potentially at any rate. It may still come out in 2013, but I'm entirely fine with waiting until 2014, especially if it means a better PC port. There have actually been quite a few delays of major titles lately, and I view almost all of them as being positive. In fact, no, I view all of them as being positive. There are plenty of games available. I'm not chomping at the bit to play Bioshock Infinite or Dark Souls 2 or any of the other games that have been pushed back. I just want them to be good, and I want them to be good from the very beginning. It also means if you're going to push it back, then you do not have an excuse for a lousy PC port. So what we've been seeing from Bioshock Infinite, of course, is that the PC port is looking better than ever, and hopefully the PC port of Dark Souls 2, which is supposed to be out at the same time as the 360 and PlayStation 3 versions, will also be up to snuff. New research from ICO Partners was centered on the maturity of Kickstarter and as to whether or not the platform has reached a plateau. Contrary to popular internet belief, it would appear that the service has not, in fact, hit its plateau. In fact, the average amount of funding for games as well as the average price of successfully funded Kickstarter games has gone up over the past three months. 
ICO Partners reported that the median average for funding was approximately $33,500, which is up from $28,700 at the beginning of September. Bear in mind, this is a median average. The reason being that the top funded project, stuff that's like funding four to eight million would vastly skew the actual average number. If you were to go for a pure average, then you're looking more like about $175,000. ICO analyst Thomas Bedeau is quoted as saying that overall it feels like the platform is on the path to maturity for video games and is getting there quite fast. Interesting news, honestly, considering that, as I said before, there's been a little bit of populist rambling, one would say, that Kickstarter is dying, the bubble has burst, and everything is going horribly wrong. There's also been some controversy lately as regarding Kickstarter, the most recent being a report that the developer of Code Hero had essentially just picked up and ran off with the money. Unfortunately, it seems like this report was a false rumor spread by a single backer on the Kickstarter page, which was blown completely out of proportion and resulted in several major gaming sites actually picking up the story as if it were fact. It turns out that it was not, and a statement was made by the developer on that very day, which was designed to quell fears that everything was going horribly wrong with the project and it would never see the light of day. It's hard to see just how true all of this is, however, because we do only have the developer's word for it, and the supposed second alpha for the game was delayed. Now, I played the first alpha for the game back at PAX, and I can assure you it is a game, it is a real thing and the game looked like it was on a reasonable path to success, although it was certainly very shaky being an early alpha. The concern most people have in regards to Kickstarter, of course, is whether or not the actual game that they back, or indeed the product that they back, will ever be made, and it is entirely possible that it won't. As it stands, however, it seems that the majority of big video game projects are at least receiving some kind of progress with games like the Banner Saga having already released their multiplayer beta, clear advancement on the front of titles like Star Citizen as well as Planetary Annihilation and Wasteland 2. When it comes to Kickstarter, I would have to say to everyone, just remember that it's almost like gambling. You never gamble with money that you can't afford to lose. That's exactly the same approach you should take to Kickstarter. Put it out there and spend the money on it, sure, no problem. But just bear in mind that there is the possibility the game will not actually come out. And if that is the case, then there really isn't a way for you to get your money back. Now, if of course fraud is involved and the guys just ran off with the money, then a class action lawsuit could get your money back, but it is a massive hassle. So please do not back Kickstarter projects unless you are willing to take the risk that the product will actually not come out. It is entirely possible that many of these Kickstarters are based on the notion that they can afford to create it for a certain amount of money, and yet they realize a year down the line that absolutely not, they can't do that. Kickstarter is a risk, but you are not an investor when it comes to Kickstarter. You must bear that in mind. Investors have some form of protection. That's why they take the risk, because they can then make a profit off of it. They take the risk in order to hopefully make a lot more back, and sometimes it works out, sometimes it does not. You, as a Kickstarter backer, are not an investor. The only thing you're doing is putting down money in the hopes that a product will actually come out and be funded by your money. If it does come out, great, but don't expect to be paid any dividends. If it doesn't, then don't expect to get a refund either. Please do your research before tackling anything on Kickstarter. That's usually the best way to do it. It's fairly easy to spot if someone has the pedigree to ensure that a game is actually going to get finished. If they do not and they seem to be promising the earth, then I would suggest that it's probably not a good idea to back it. And finally, Rayman Jungle Run, the iOS version of Rayman Origins brought to you by Ubisoft, has been named Game of the Year on the App Store in the US, UK, France, Italy, Germany, Russia, Japan, China, and Australia. However, since Belgium and Bulgaria are off the list, I clearly cannot consider this to be an official rating. The game has recently been updated with some free DLC, as well as optional in-app purchases for new characters and costumes. The game will set you back about $3 and is available on iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch and Android platforms and costs about £1.99 in the UK. And you know what, I've got this and I don't necessarily blame them for naming this Game of the Year on the App Store. It's really quite surprising. 
I picked this game up and I tried it out and you know what? It was actually good. <laughs> and that really shocked me. It's essentially a running game. So, as you might imagine by the name of the title, you run through the jungle and then you tap the screen in order to jump, slide, fly and all the other stuff that you have to do at about the right time and the levels are actually so well designed they feel really really good and what surprised me is just how much it feels like a Rayman game despite only having one button. The running means that you have to be very prepared for what's coming. You can't stop and you have to jump at the right time all the time or slide or glide or whatever the level requires you to do in order to actually pick up all the lums in the first place otherwise you will not get the full rating and you will not get all the unlocks. It's also graphically beautiful with great sound and it's got the music from Rayman Origins so why would it not be great? It's a really good game and it's actually genuinely challenging. And that's a good way of getting around the obvious interface problems with the iPad and the iPhone being that they don't have a bloody interface. It's the screen. That's all you can do. I've got to say, if a game has virtual controls on the screen, I tend to completely abandon the notion of enjoying it because it's horrible. It really, really is. Just having to kind of slide your thumb around on the screen. There's obviously no resistance there, so it's really awful. You don't have a physical stick. The controls are really, really imprecise on pretty much every game that does that. And of course, you're covering the screen so you can't see certain parts of it, which is really horrible. Thankfully, anything that's like, say, Jungle Run or Tiny Wings that is based around the notion that you can play a game with only a single button and yet still have the game actually be challenging, well, that's a game that I'm interested in. And obviously, it's still pretty much toilet gaming. It's designed for short spurts of gameplay. It's not anywhere near as good as Rayman Origins or Rayman Legends would be, but for two pounds and three dollars it's actually a great game it is really well produced the art assets are nothing short of astonishing it's incredibly high fidelity and free content you can't really complain about that so i would recommend you go and try it out honestly it's a good little casual game but it's pretty damn challenging if you want to actually 100 percent the whole thing and requires a great deal of skill preparation and of course timing all right folks that is me done for the day thank you very much for watching the content patch and I will see you next time.